Hello. Let's see. Is this working? Is this thing on? All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to our June. That's right. June. Dot, Baton Rouge dot net user group. So looks like we have some new faces in the crowd. I really appreciate all of y'all joining us. If you don't know who I am, my name is Brian McCoy. I've been running or helping out with the user group for the past couple of years. We have slowly transitioned into streaming. So I think all of our, our user group members who have followed us here. So let's see. Tonight, we have a very awesome guest for you. I am excited to hear him speak, but before that, we'll do we'll do some typical uh, house cleaning. Again, my name is Brian McCoy. I'm also joined tonight with Jeremy Cronin. He's been helping out with the group for a while. Um, you may have recognized the name Jeremy. This week, it's Jeremy Cronin. Typically, Jeremy Knight is my producer behind the scenes. You may also notice the new layout. So we are actually making the switch to to Streamlabs. So hopefully it, it helps to eliminate some of the some of the, the issues that we've had in the past. So we're, we'll continue to try to make the stream better for you as best we can. So for tonight, please utilize the Twitch chat. Um, we also have a Discord channel. If you want to join us in there, we will be monitoring both for questions. So myself or Jeremy will relay those to our speaker. <clears throat> um, yeah, if you're looking for ways to get in touch with us, you can always follow us on Twitter or Facebook. The links will be below in our social our social media um, section. You can follow us on Twitter at uh, brdnug. Um, please, you know, reach out to us if you ever want to come on stream. If you ever have something that you want to present, this is a community channel. We would really love to have you on. Speaking of being a community channel, this Sunday morning we will have another Sunday short. Uh, two weeks ago, I was joined by a good friend of mine named Jake. We did some F sharp stuff. It was really entertaining and a lot of fun. If you watch that stream or the VOD on YouTube, let me know. He would be happy to come back. I think we're going to do some more F sharp stuff in the future. We had a lot of good feedback about that stream. So that may be something we're looking to do. So let us know. Let's see what else. Again, we ship all of our VODs. Uh, from Twitch to YouTube, you can find all of our past streams there. Be sure to go like, subscribe, you know, whatever you do on YouTube. Um, let's see, Jeremy is so kindly posting links in the chat, so I appreciate that. We have a Facebook group, uh, like I said, Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, Discord, we're everywhere that you can find us. Let's see, what else do we have? Oh, Teals. So, Teals organization. Is, has come to Louisiana, and I believe they they may still be looking for volunteers. If nothing else, I would really like to extend my thanks to the community. Um, Lucia has had very nice things to say about the people in the Baton Rouge.net user group. I believe a third of their volunteers have come from either just direct volunteers from our user group or our user group spreading um, information about Teals coming to Louisiana. So we have a lot of good support for the Teals organization coming directly from this community. I really appreciate that. That's what we really want to be here for. So thank you so much for that. Let's see. I don't know if we have anything else. Um, it looks like our viewer account is slowly growing. So this is exciting. Uh, I bet it has something to do with our speaker, but that's okay because that's why we brought him here. But I would like to introduce to you our Dallas. So, our Steve Smith, uh, how would you like to be referred to, sir? So, so I, I respond to either. It's fine. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. So, what are you be showing us tonight? We are going to be talking about uh, clean architecture with ASP.NET Core. Awesome. I really appreciate it. Favorite topic of mine. It's it's actually a favorite topic of mine. I've actually been using it for a few years now. Um, so I really appreciate the info you put out there for us. And without further ado, I'll let you uh, take the stage. Awesome. Um, thanks a lot. I'm glad to be here. Uh, it's not quite the same as uh, traveling around and, and seeing people in person, um, but we're almost there. Um, so maybe maybe soon I'll be able to, to come down and visit y'all in, in person. Um, for tonight, my, my plan is to talk about clean architecture with ASP.NET Core, um, as, as I said, and as you can read, uh, 
if you don't know who I am, uh, my name is Steve Smith. If you don't know me, you probably know someone else named Steve Smith because there are like thousands of us. Um, and so I go by our Dallas online, uh, mostly so that I can actually have a username that's consistent across different places and uh, people can actually find me in a sea of other Steve Smiths. Uh, so if you're looking for any more information on me afterward, um, you can find me on Twitter, GitHub, uh, rdallas.com, et cetera, all, all under that name. Um, let's go ahead and, uh, and get started. I've got a few uh, resources I want to share with you before we get into the, the actual topic. So forgive me for a little bit of, uh, of self-promotion here, um, but hopefully some of these things you'll find useful. Uh, most of them are free. So I, I have a bunch of stuff on Pluralsight. Uh, and so probably easiest, I got tired of updating the slide um, with like the most recent courses. So let me just throw this up here. If you have a Pluralsight subscription, you can get access to all this stuff, obviously. If you don't, you can sign up for like a 10 day trial uh, with your email and, and watch stuff. Um, or if you wanna email me, um, I can usually get you like a 30 day pass, even if you've used a trial before. So if you really just wanna watch one of the courses that I'm sharing here with you, just reach out and I'll try and hook you up. Um, my latest course was actually just last Friday, which is a C Sharp Generics Best Practices course. Um, and, and that was a, a, a ton of work to get done because I didn't start it until after I'd shipped this DDD Fundamentals update with Julie Lerman. And that was May 13th. So in the span of about three weeks, I, I got this whole thing done, which, which was crazy. Um, but hopefully it still turned out well because I, I didn't try to sacrifice quality on, on the way. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the principles and things we're going to talk about tonight with clean architecture, um, then the DDD course is is the place for you. It's all been redone. I had a course with Julie that we did way back in 2014 here that's now been retired. You can still watch it, um, but that one is for .NET 4. Uh, you know, .NET Core didn't exist back then. Um, and so, you know, it's samples and everything are, are a little bit dated at this point. So the new one, I totally rebuilt all the samples. They're, everything's using Docker, everything's using .NET 5. Um, and so you can kind of see all these principles and practices in place uh, in a real world sort of sample application. Uh, it's actually several applications that communicate with one another. Um, so, so definitely check those out if you're interested. Um, this ebook I've had for a few years out, to, uh, out there now, it's, it's getting updated with each new release of .NET. Um, so it's currently on .NET 5. I think this one says .NET Core 3.1, but it's really .NET 5 now. Um, and so it's a, a book, it's about 100 pages long, PDF, totally free, uh, goes along with the eShop on Web sample app, which if we have some time tonight, maybe I'll show you. Um, and, and that's you know basically a, a reference application using ASP.NET Core that kind of shows how to build applications that follow solid principles and, and good ac architectural principles. Um, if you do need help with any of that with your team, whether you're porting stuff to .NET Core or .NET 5, um, or you just want some training up on domain-driven design or architectural stuff, um, hit me up for some mentoring or training. Um, and if you as an individual would like to accelerate your career as a developer, uh, and you're interested whether it's climbing the corporate ladder or going independent and, and starting your own business, uh, you know those are things that we talk about regularly in my group coaching program that I have at DevBetter. Uh, I also have a podcast and I also stream on Twitch uh, as our Dallas. Um, the podcast has been a little bit slow this year, but I'll, I'll try and add some more episodes over the summer. Um, and that's that's enough about me. So let's let's get into the topic. So um, as we go, uh, please do ask questions. Um, you can you know ask them in, in Twitch in the comments and I'll pause every now and then and, and they'll uh, read the, the questions to me uh, so, so I can make sure I'm answering them as I go. Um, so if you have any questions, even now as we're getting ready to get started, throw them out there, right? If you've already, you know, seen some of the stuff that I've shared, or or you are, you know, read, you know, a book about clean architecture or whatever it might be, um, feel free to toss those questions out there now. Um, usually, when I give these presentations in person, everybody is too shy to actually have any questions, or they don't know what they should ask because they haven't heard my talk yet. Um, and so I use this trick where I just kind of seed the talk with some questions up front. Um, and so some of the questions that we're going to answer tonight are things like, why do we bother to separate our applications into multiple projects? Like, why don't we just make everything one giant project? And maybe sometimes that's appropriate, right? Um, and if we do want to split things up, what are some principles that we could follow, that we could apply, that would tell us what the best way is to break things up? And where, where, where should the seams be? What belongs in, in this or that project and why? Um, when we make those decisions, when we split things up, what kind of impact does that have on coupling in the solution. Uh, you, you're gonna have to have some coupling for your application to work. 
but we'd always rather have loose coupling than tight coupling because it makes it easier for us to make changes in the future. And if we kind of make the wrong decisions, what are some of the problems that we can get ourselves into? Uh, and so some of the pitfalls that we're gonna try and avoid. Then we'll talk about clean architecture um, and, and see kind of how, how it fits into all of this. Uh, it's not a panacea, it doesn't fix every problem, um, but it does have a lot of, I think, positive trade-offs overall. So um, that's what uh, I'm, I'm mostly gonna be talking about here is my experience with it and, and why I think it fits uh, a lot of solutions that are being built, especially if you're using uh, things like test-driven development uh, or domain-driven development or, or things like that. All right, so before we jump into the architecture uh, itself, let's let's first jump into uh, some principles. All right, so these are going to kind of guide us when we, when we are evaluating or assessing whether or not this or that architectural decision makes sense because everything in software architecture and, and really in programming in general is just trade-offs. Right. If if I say that this is always the right way to do it, you know, I'm lying. Uh, partly that's because I'm a consultant, and so my my motto is it depends. Um, but but just the fact of it is that every decision we make is a decision optimized for A at the expense of B. Um, and so you know we're gonna use these principles to kind of guide us. But that's because these principles you know generally are leading us toward things that we care more about. For example, separation of concerns is is a widely held. Uh, principle in software development that suggests that we would like to keep, you know, different parts of our application separate from one another so they don't pollute each other, right? We don't want to have low-level plumbing code just intermingled with our business logic and, and maybe our user uh, interface logic as well. Um, that's going to make it harder for us to split those things apart or make changes to them or make them more modular um, if it's just a bunch of spaghetti code and everything's mixed together. Uh, and so if you take a look at this refrigerator, hopefully this isn't what your refrigerator looks like at your home, um, but you can see there's some things in here that maybe that's not the right place to put them in your kitchen. Um, and so right away, you know, we'd like to keep plumbing concerns out of the other concerns in our system and not let it kind of pollute um, that, that stuff. So you know, mix, mixing these responsibilities in the same place uh, is something we strive to avoid using separation of concerns. And the big three that we're most concerned with uh, are going to be things like data access, business logic, and your domain model, um, and your user interface concerns. Now, working very closely with separation of concerns is another principle called single responsibility. And single responsibility principle is one of the solid principles. Um, and it basically says, that your classes should only have a single reason to change. Uh, and so if you have you know, different stakeholders or different things that your code needs to do in different ways, um, any given class should ideally only need to be changed or swapped out in response to one axis of change. So you know, if you have something that needs to generate reports and it's got some software for how it builds the report and some software for how it gets the data and some you know, algorithms for how it formats the data uh, and, and things like that, right? You wouldn't wanna put all that in one place if you could help it because it's possible that you'd wanna swap out each one of those independently from one another, okay? Another very common principle that we like to follow in software development is don't repeat yourself or the dry principle. Um, and the dry principle is uh, sometimes overused. Sometimes you eliminate duplication and introduce coupling where, where you shouldn't. Um, but more often than not, the problem is that there's too much duplication and you have different concepts or literally the same code just copy pasted in you know n different places within your application. And so you wanna find a way to uh, have a single canonical place for any given decision or concept to live in your code. All right, so when you follow the don't repeat yourself principle, this is gonna help us uh, sort of organize our system because we're gonna take repetitive code, we're gonna organize that into functions or methods. Um, and then to make it easier for us to locate and work with these functions, we're gonna group them into cohesive classes. Um, and then we'll further group those up typically into folders and namespaces using whatever makes sense to the team, right? Generally, uh, things like what their responsibilities are or how abstract they might be, whether they're low level or high level and things like that. Um, and we can take this even further and eventually group these things into projects. Um, and the whole idea of you know grouping things in taking smaller pieces and grouping them up um, is one of the ways that we organize complexity in our systems. And that's what domain-driven design is all about, is tackling complexity in software. Uh, and so it takes these different kind of standard ways 
of organizing C sharp code, and it actually adds a few additional uh, containers to to the mix um, at, at different levels of granularity that you don't see here. So we're not going to get into DDD in, in tonight's topic, um, but DDD has two patterns that it uses heavily. One is aggregates, uh, which is a way to group different entities together that change together. And another one is bounded context, which is a way for you to have uh, different uh, ubiquitous languages and, and models uh, in different parts of a large system or organization, and then have them communicate with each other through uh, explicit interfaces instead of through some type of global state mechanism. And then not terribly necessarily related to DDD is features. Um, a lot of teams find uh, that it's helpful to organize code in, in vertical slices by feature um, as a way to, to kind of keep things uh, modular and, and organized in one place. So these are some other options that you have when you're thinking about how to split things up. And splitting things up the right way is, is all about what architecture is and what clean architecture is, is trying to tackle. Um, and that's why these are relevant for us today. All right, then another principle is the, the other end of the solid principles is the dependency inversion principle. And dependency inversion sounds like dependency injection, and actually they, they go together uh, quite, quite well. Dependency inversion is all about making it so that your low-level code that knows how to talk to infrastructure concerns um, depends on your abstractions and not the other way around, right? And, and at your... Uh, your high level code that knows like at a high level what the business concerns are, that it doesn't depend on that low level code. Uh, and so that's why we're inverting it because usually that's the typical way it works. And so if you think about the interface of your power outlet on your wall, right, it supports an interface, which is the shape of, you know, the prongs that are gonna fit into it for a US uh, standard appliance. And the two sides have both agreed to that interface, right? The wall, it supports one interface and the lamp or other appliance also has a plug that fits that interface. Um, and so it's literally a plug and play, you know, architecture at that point. Uh, and if you go off to Europe or some other country that uses a different interface, you can use an adapter to make it so you can still plug in. And we have a software design pattern called adapter that does exactly that. Right. And so using this as something that we do in the real world, we can take those same principles and apply them to our software to get better results. All right. And so the idea with dependency inversion is, slide will move, there we go, um, is that both your high level uh, classes and implementation, low level detail classes should depend on abstractions. And when we're talking abstractions in C Sharp, we're usually talking about interfaces, sometimes abstract based classes, but most of the time we mean interfaces. All right. The other thing is, uh, another principle you maybe haven't heard of because I made it up, um, but I do have some, some articles and stuff out there about it. Uh, classes should follow the explicit dependencies principle. So uh, what is that? Well, a few years ago, I wrote a series of articles that were all about hidden dependencies and, and things that would bite you when you went to try and use a service or a class and it looked like it would work just fine. But as you were starting to work with it at runtime somewhere, it would just blow up uh, and tell you that it needed some, some resource, something that you hadn't given it. Um, and so I, I talked about those as, as being hidden dependencies that were just cause an unpleasant surprise to developers who were trying to use them. Uh, and so if you follow the explicit dependencies principle, you never run into that because your services are gonna request everything they need through their constructor and that allows you to use dependency injection. Uh, in fact, the best type of dependency injection, which is constructor injection. Um, and it, it basically self documents all your classes. It says, this is exactly what I need to do what I need to do. Um, and if you give me those things and, and they're valid, right? You don't pass in a bunch of nulls or whatever, um, then you can expect that I'm going to do my job properly. Uh, and so this makes it so your classes are honest about what they need and not deceptive. They're not going to surprise you halfway through with, with something that they actually didn't tell you they needed. Um, recently, I was talking about this, um, I think, at another user group uh, or a client, and it came to me that this is basically your classes are like a recipe, right? If you ever read a recipe, you know, the first thing it lists is the ingredients. It says, I need this, 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 this. And you first thing, if you're thinking about making it, you're in your head, you're saying, I got that, I got that, I got that. Yeah, okay, good. This sounds good. I'm going to make this recipe. So you grab the things and you start. And you oftentimes you don't read the whole recipe, right? You just, you know, you have the stuff, you know, you're a competent cook. So, you know, you go from there. And so it would really annoy you if you got halfway through the recipe and it was like, okay, now add the uh, two pounds of pomegranate. And you're like, what? That, that's not in the ingredients. I don't have two pounds of pomegranate. What? That's crazy. Like, that's what we're trying to avoid, right? Say everything you need at the top of your class in the constructor and avoid all that frustration with surprising folks with things that they didn't know that they needed. All right. So 
when we're talking about dependency inversion, um, and we're saying that these dependencies need to depend on the abstractions or interfaces, there's a corollary here that says where in our solution, in our projects, um, are we going to put those interfaces? And they have to be accessible to the low level implementation services and the high level business services. And then you need to have some composition root where you're gonna wire those things up. If you're using a dependency inversion container, uh, like .NET has built in or Autofac or any of those types of things, um, you have this uh, composition root usually somewhere close to where the app starts up. In ASP.NET Core, it's gonna be in startup.cs. Um, and so the user interface entry point also needs that access to those interfaces. So basically everything needs to be able to get to those interfaces. And that's gonna play an important role on where we decide to put them in our architecture. All right, so wrapping up with the dependency inversion principle, let me show you these two different images. Uh, the first one here is if you don't follow the principle, you don't have any abstractions, and you just build a system where every time you need some functionality, you new up a new class and you call a method on it. So on the left at compile time, you know the compiler checks and says, okay, yes, this, this class can new up this other class, call the method, it news up this other class, calls a method, okay. So you have A that references B that references C, and on the right, when you run it, if you have an exception or set a breakpoint in class C and you look at the stack trace, it's gonna look identical. It's gonna be you know class A called into something in class B that called into something in class C. Um, and for a lot of developers, this is the only way they know how to write code. This is true for me for a long time early in my career. I didn't know how to do it any other way. It wasn't until I, I hit some problems where I was really blocked trying to figure out how to test some stuff in isolation that I, I finally realized like the role of interfaces in this whole thing. And so with interfaces, you can break that. You can make it so your compile time dependency chain is completely different from your runtime dependency chain. And that's the, the big epiphany that dependency inversion principle and dependency injection yields for you is that you suddenly get this Lego-like uh, ability to swap in implementations inside your code. Uh, and that makes it really powerful uh, because you're able to change out functionality without actually having to edit the code in a class, right? If there's a class and you want it to do something else, write a new class and swap it in, right? That's way less likely to break things than if you have to go in and add one more else statement to a ginormous method with you know 5,000 lines in it that's already got way too many if statements to follow. Um, you know, adding new code to new classes is a great way to extend legacy systems in a, in a safer way. All right, so I covered a whole lot of stuff with principles there. Um, let, me, let me grab a quick drink and see, did anybody have any questions? Because I promised I'd stop along the way for questions and I've been talking nonstop. Uh, so far, no, we have some NPM comments, but that's okay, we welcome those here. But uh, right. so far, no questions. All right, cool. Um, so a couple last things here before we get into uh, how to actually structure your code. The whole thing with this is that we wanna make it so based on how we organize our system, our, our solution, our application, we wanna make the right thing easy and the wrong thing hard so that we kind of force developers who admit it are, are kind of lazy. You know, we, we've got deadlines to hit and we wanna just get things done and follow the path of least resistance. We want that path of least resistance to lead you into the pit of success. We don't wanna make it so, you know, doing the easy thing is totally wrong and you have to go read all these documentation and always remember this checklist of things to do to do it the right way, right? Um, that will lead you into the pit of despair, which, which is not a good place to be. So to make the right thing easy and the wrong thing hard, how can we structure the solution so that we don't have our user interface classes directly depending on the infrastructure stuff? How can we make it so that the uh, domain classes, the business logic doesn't directly depend on infrastructure stuff like, like the database, like the file system, like you know email? Um, how can we make it so repetition is hard to do or, or not as easy to do as leveraging some shared policy? Right, and that's a hard one to, to beat, right? Because copy paste is really easy. So making something easier than copy paste is a challenge. Um, but that's what we want to strive to do. We want to make it just automatic that certain policies and certain you know things are enforced in our design, um, even easier than just having developers copy paste logic all over. Okay, so let's first talk about this sort of classic N-tier architecture that was the best practice. Uh, he said in air quotes um, for for many years. Uh, in fact, my very first conference presentation, uh, one, of, one of my talks was on this topic, uh, and, and I had this diagram in it from 2001, uh, which was, you know, from Microsoft, it was, you know, right off their MSDN website that's, that's no longer with us. Um, and on the left was how a lot of software was built at the time. 
and and probably still is, where basically everything was together, whether you're writing it in like VB6 or, or ASP or what have you, you know, all the business logic, all the UI code was just all intermingled in the same file. Uh, and, it, and it made it difficult to do things like split up teams and, and have specialists and, you know, work on large solutions um, with multiple teams and things like that. So breaking it up into these different tiers or layers allowed for code reuse, allowed for team segmentation and specialization. It gave us a lot of benefits at the time. Um, however, if you look at how the dependency tree was structured, right, the data access layer was tightly coupled to the database, right? It was ADO.net typically, or, or ADO even um, before that. Uh, and it would just talk directly to, to SQL Server or Oracle or whatever your database was. Um, and it couldn't do anything else, right? That's what it did. It just talked to the database. And then the business layer would talk to the data access layer to do everything it needed, typically without any abstractions, right? So it depended on the data access layer, which meant that it transitively depended on the database. And the UI layer just talked directly to the business layer. If you were lucky, it didn't do an end run and talk to the data access layer directly, but sometimes that happened too. Um, but you know, no matter what, it depended on the database by you know transitivity as well. So everything depended on the database. Now, even 20 years ago, when I gave that talk, um, we knew that automation was a good thing, right? Continuous integration, while still new, um, was something that a lot of folks had been trying uh, even in the 90s, and, and lots of folks were seeing success with it, and it was certainly better than working on something in isolation for a year and then spending months trying to you know make it all talk to each other and actually ship the thing. Um, and so trying to integrate stuff more frequently, trying to write automated tests that verified it worked um, were, were things that were gaining hold. You know, test-driven development was uh, a book written by Kent Beck, and that was published in the in the 90s. Um, so these things, you know, existed, but trying to use this architecture and then follow those types of practices was incredibly painful. I know because I did it, and I tried to write a lot of tests that went through this architecture, and it just sucks the life away from you because every time you're trying to add another test, you've got this big script of all your test data and schema for the database, and everything depends on the database. So you have to run that before every test. Uh, and as you keep adding more tests, you know they just keep getting slower and slower and slower. And it didn't take very many tests at all before you know, it would take 10 minutes for you to run your test run. Um, and it was really difficult to, to, you know, let that give you that fast feedback that you want when you have to wait 10 minutes every time you, you add another test or want to run your test. Um, so it just, it was painful. All right. So domain centric design is, is an alternative approach to that end tier layer. Uh, and it has a bunch of different names that we'll talk about in just a second. Um, domain centric design is, is one of them. That's sort of descriptive of what it is, not, not the pattern itself. Um, and clean architecture is just one of those things. So if you look at this diagram, instead of it being a bunch of uh, boxes stacked on top of each other, it's uh, concentric circles. And the idea is that in the core of your application, in the central circle, you put your business logic in a way that has no dependencies on anything else, except maybe you know, your underlying framework like .NET. Um, and then everything else is outside of there. And your dependencies always point inward uh, is the way to think about this. All right, so in your domain model, you're going to have your business logic, but also, you know, if you're following domain driven design, you're going to have a model of the problem space and it's going to have certain things in it, certain patterns and, and types of, uh, you know, types like uh, interfaces, for example, um, that you use to create a model of, of the complexity of the software, what the business rules are and the behaviors should be. Um, those interfaces work with the domain objects. So um, other parts of your system, other services, things in your infrastructure layer, uh, things in your UI layer, they're all going to use those interfaces in order to work with your domain model. Um, and everything else in your system, including data access, including all that stuff that's tightly coupled to the database, is going to depend on this core domain model and its abstractions, its interfaces. All right, so clean architecture, you may also have heard called Onion architecture, which my friend Jeffrey Palermo uh, coined that term about, I don't know, it's been like 12 years now, I think it was 2009, um, in a series of blog posts. Um, but even before that, it was known as hexagonal architecture or ports and adapters. Um, it's not exactly new. It's been something that folks have written about and been using for, for quite a long time. Um, here's a, another diagram, a little more detailed than the first one I showed you. It's using the onion architecture style of concentric circles. And at the very center, you've got your domain entities. Around that, you've got these repository interfaces that you use to access the domain entities. 
around that, you've got you know application services or domain services that um, that work with those as well. And then everything else is in the purple region where you know these are different projects. So you've got test projects, you've got user interface projects, you've got infrastructure projects that all depend inward on that core domain. So those those inner three circles are usually one project, maybe two, um, and everything else depends on those. Looking at it from hexagonal or ports and adapters, um, it's kind of funny that they would name it hexagonal architecture just because somebody decided to use uh, hexagons on, on, a, on a slide like this, but that's how the world works. Um, so in here, you've got your domain layer again at the center, uh, and those purple ports are interfaces, right? And the implementations of those interfaces are the adapters that are all around the outside in the orange and the blue, right? So if we look at the top right, you've got this internal persistence port. That is basically how it's going to save and retrieve uh, data to some data store. And it can either plug in a remote database management system like SQL Server or Oracle, or it could use an in-memory store and it could just swap out which one of those it wants to use. Now, a lot of folks uh, over the years and even today, I'm sure, will say, hey, how likely is it that we're really going to ever change our database? Um, and the answer is actually pretty likely, not necessarily that in production, you're going to you know, trash SQL Server and go start using Oracle. But in different environments, it's often very handy to be able to switch out which database provider you're using. Right? What you use on localhost versus in your dev environment, your test environment, your stage environment, your production environment, those can all be different. You can plug in different adapters to, that make sense at those levels. And as you move into the cloud and you have different uh, pricing based on which cloud product you're using, it might be really nice that you could just plug in a Docker container with a you know a, a free version of SQL Server and use that instead of Cosmos DB or something that's going to charge you a lot more, uh, which you use in production. And yes, you know there's some tests that you're going to want to use the real data adapter for, but you can do a lot of automation and testing for your system using a stand-in for how the real persistence works if you architect your system correctly. Okay, so. That's ports and adapters, hexagonal, onion, all different names for clean architecture. Clean architecture, um, Uncle Bob Martin's got a book with the same name. He talks about it there, uh, but it's, it's basically the latest name for the same type of uh, architecture. So quick so, question, yeah. Yes, real quick. Um, let's see if I got this right. Uh, let's see, Dan Spark asked, are service interfaces part of the core domain? I believe he brought this question up when you were talking here. Yep. Um, yeah, some some will be, and we'll talk about this. There's going to be services probably at, at many different layers in your system, um, but you typically have domain services that are part of your domain layer, your domain model, um, and so that's usually what this would be. Um, but sometimes you'll also have another layer of application services, and and those might live in a different project. Uh, and so we'll we'll talk about that. And so depending on how many separations you find valuable for your application, which will largely depend on how large and complex it might be, um, you might have uh, services that are are spanning different projects. Uh, but you'll almost always have some at the domain model level uh, and some at at other levels in your system. So that that's a good question. Do we have quite time for one more? Um, yep. I'm not going to get this right, but. What is a good indicator to start building your projects clean in terms of pain-driven development? What are the pains that make you decide to start breaking things into these layers? I love that this uh, person is, is using pain-driven development because I usually talk about that in, the, in a lot of my talks. So maybe you heard it from me. Um, I didn't invent the term, but I do love it. Uh, yeah, so why would you bother starting out with all of this overhead if you don't know if you're going to need it? Uh, I think is, is really the, the, the question there. And it's, it's a good one. Um, if I'm building something that is going to be for a, a client that's paying me money that wants to uh, build this thing as something that's core to their business, that their business is betting on, and they're going to be making money on, then I'm going to probably pick this architecture nine times out of 10. Now, Part of that is because of uh, survivorship bias, uh, if you will, where, you know, because of the things I talk about and the courses that I do on Pluralsight and the reputation I have, folks come to me when they have the type of problem that I'm good at solving, right? So if I were building a simple CRUD application, I probably would not use this structure, right? But that's not typically the type of applications folks ask me for help with. Um, so, so the delineator that I would suggest is, is basically the same calculus you would use on whether you'd want to apply domain-driven design. And with domain-driven design, the biggest thing is, is there sufficient business complexity to warrant the effort of all the abstractions and layers and things that domain-driven design brings to the table um, for this application? Or is it just 
a matter of pushing data in and out of a database and letting users manage it with some, you know, simple uh, forms or something. It's just a forms over data CRUD app. Um, and usually the way you can tell that is by how many uh, if statements you've got inside the code, right? When I, when I want to see how complex uh, a domain model is, I, I calculate its, you know, conditional complexity um, and start looking at all the, all the if statements and the rules. That's where you need to write a lot of tests. That's where you need to verify that all that conditional stuff works correctly. Um, if you have a system where your domain entities, if you will, um, your, your tables that you're referencing in C-sharp as, as some type of object, um, if they are nothing but properties and they have no validation logic, they have no events that fire off, they have no when this happens, that should happen, right? They don't have any behavior. All you do is fetch them from the database, change some things and save them, and that's it, or that's 99% of it, um, then you probably don't need domain-driven design or clean architecture, right? Build a uh, file new project, ASP.NET Core, uh, maybe, maybe do it with... Uh, some kind of code generator like CodeSmith or something like that that can just look at your database schema and build out the app for you um, or, or go in and right click and use Visual Studio to code gen uh, a bunch of controllers or razor pages with uh, views that will do all the crud for you. Um, and you can have your app like, you know, 60, 70 percent done uh, in, in less than an hour just by using code gen for that type of app uh, and not have to spend all this time on, on architecture and principles and, and everything else. Um, that'll get you a lot of the way there for CRUD type apps. And if you don't know CRUD, CRUD stands for create, read, update, delete. So the, the four standard data access uh, things you do uh, with a piece of data in a database. All right. So great, great question. Um, all right. So let's talk about the rules of clean architecture. So the first rule of clean architecture, and I do have a few uh, movie references in here, um, is that you don't talk about clean. No, that's, that's not right. That's not the right one. Um, the first rule is that uh, the application core is the place that contains your domain model. Now, if you're not doing DDD, then that just means it's the place where your business objects live, right? Just everywhere I say domain model, you think business logic, business objects, put it in there. Um, the next rule is that all of your dependencies point toward the domain model. They point toward that core project, all right? And then another rule that we've kind of already covered um, is that all your interfaces have to be implemented in the inner projects, right? And the outer projects implement them and reference them. Sometimes you'll have implementations in the same project, but um, because of the way the dependencies work, you have to have the uh, interface defined in an inner project for an outer project to be able to get to it because the outer projects depend on the inner projects. All right. Next, uh, you want to avoid directly depending on the infrastructure project. Of all the projects you have, um, the infrastructure project, and, and sometimes you'll, you'll have more than one. Uh, maybe you split them out and you have one that's just for data access and, and another one that's for everything else or, or for messaging or something like that. But usually, at least to start, you're fine to put them all in one project. Um, and, and that infrastructure project, that's how your system talks to things that aren't in memory. Right? That's how it talks to a database or a file or something on a network. Um, and so we put all that stuff in its own project and then we try not to really depend on that project any more than necessary. Um, because anything that depends on that becomes more difficult to test and more difficult to change. Uh, and so we, we try and keep all of the, the dependency going through interfaces so that they're loosely coupled and not tightly coupled. All right, so what are some of the, the features of clean architecture? Well, it's framework independent, so it works whether you're doing it with ASP.NET Core or Python or Java or anything else. Um, it's database independent. It doesn't even care if you have a database. You can write an application and add a database like at the very, very end. Uh, and the whole rest of the way that you've been building it, um, you're just building it with an in-memory data provider or a file system or whatever, right? The database is uh, just implementation detail. Right. It's just a place to store things in between requests. It's not that big a deal. Um, and when you move to the cloud, it's good to have a, a database agnostic uh, approach because you don't want to be coupled to this one, you know, super important SQL Server database. Uh, you want to be open to options because that lets you do things like have distributed data, which gives you more scalability options. Um, and so, you know, it, it fits in nicely with, with cloud native application design. And of course, it's UI dependent, right? It, it works whether you're building a worker service or a console app or a, a web forms app or WPF or whatever it might be. All right. The other thing that I really like about it is that it is very testable. Um, I think that it's a crime to manually test your code at the rates that you're probably charging or uh, whether your salary or consulting as a software developer in, in the current you know, industry. Um, you know, your time is very valuable. And so if you're manually testing code on, on the clock, 
right? You're stealing from your client because you could have written tests in a fraction of that time that would run every single time you you check in your code or every time you you say .NET test at the command line, and in you know less than a few seconds, it's tested everything. Right, in the time it would take you to hit F5 and start debugging into the app one time, it's already tested all of the all the things that you know how to test. Uh, and yeah, you've got to spend some time writing those tests, and maybe you're not that fast at it to start, but you will get faster. Um, and and once you write them, they're an uh, investment that keeps on giving. Right, the, there's a very long tail on the value you get from those automated tests. So, um, using a testable architecture uh, pays big dividends, especially if you're trying to have organizational agility in the future and you want to be able to refactor or redesign the application to work in a different way later on down the line. Speaking of refactoring, um, if you have an existing app and you want to shift it from its current architecture to clean architecture, the easiest way is to start from a, a system that is already laid out properly, a, a solution template. Um, I have a solution template that is laid out properly and you can get it for free at GitHub here. Um, and there's a, even a, a .NET new template you can install and then you just say .NET new clean arch um, and it will create it for you uh, and, and give you the proper namespaces and everything. So that's the easiest way to start. Um, next best is if you have an application that's just one project because the dependencies there are usually easier to tease apart and start breaking things up into like core and infrastructure projects. Um, the hardest is when you already have a bunch of projects and their dependencies all go the wrong direction. Right? So if you're already using that, that classic N tier style and the UI depends on the business layer and that depends on the data layer, then that's where it's going to be a lot tougher for you to reorganize it because you basically have to flip the whole thing. Um, and that, that may take a lot more work and sometimes you'll want some external help from folks that know how to do that. Okay, so now let's talk about what goes where in clean architecture. And this is um, usually the, the, the most valuable part of, of the talk. So um, inside the core project, you wanna have your interfaces, all your abstractions. You wanna have the components that make up your domain model or your business layer. So this will be entities, value objects, aggregates, um, in DDD, aggregates is just a group of entities that change together, if you don't know that pattern. Uh, domain services live here. Domain services are services that work with your domain model. So they um, are just things that their interface, their, their methods, their parameters, their return types are all in the form of entities or value objects or aggregates or things here, right? Um, and if they have dependencies, they don't take hard-coded dependencies on you know, SQL Server or Azure. They have an interface, right? So they have some abstraction for that dependency that they need. Um, you might have custom exceptions inside your core. Uh, I, I encourage you to use custom exceptions for business level uh, things that go wrong. So uh, let's say you've got a, a checkout method and there's an order and it should never ever happen in the system that you would ever try and check out an order that had no items in it, all right? That should just, you know, the, the system has all kinds of checks to make sure that doesn't happen. But if it does, right? Instead of throwing a null reference exception or an index out of range exception when you try and iterate over the array of order items or whatever, um, it would be much, much nicer if you had an exception that said very clearly, you know, order contains no items exception or something like that. Um, that'll make it much easier for someone to track down what the problem is uh, if it ever happens, right? So use higher level exceptions for business uh, rules that should never be violated um, inside your domain model. Your domain events would live here and uh, oftentimes the domain event handlers. Sometimes you'll have handlers in other layers too, but frequently um, you will have them in the domain model. So if you're not using domain events, domain events basically are uh, a, a way that you can capture as a class something that happens that's interesting in your domain. Like I just gave an example of someone checking out an order. Um, you could have an order checked out uh, domain event. What might happen when an order is checked out? Well, all kinds of things. We might want to charge their card. We might want to ship the item. We might want to verify we have inventory. We might want to send an email to the user. Um, all kinds of stuff might happen when this event occurs. And by using an event, it makes it so those things can be loosely coupled. We don't have to have a checkout method and a service somewhere that just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger because it does everything, right? It's much more flexible to use events for that type of thing and as a way to communicate with other applications or other bounded contexts, we can take those domain events and if it makes sense, we can translate them into integration events that go out to other systems. All right, and then specifications are another thing that frequently will live in your core, in your domain model. A specification is a class that represents a query. And so you can use these to make it so that your data access is a lot more flexible um, and, and doesn't 
make it so that like, if you're using a repository pattern, if you've ever run into that scenario where you keep having to add additional methods to your repository because you need to query things different ways, you need to pull back different amounts of data with every query. And so you start out with a really simple repository and then later on it's like list customers, list customers by country, list customers by last name, list customers by last name and country with orders, right? And it just gets crazy with, with more and more methods. Specification totally fixes that. Um, you put the query logic into your model you can test it independently from the database um, and you just plug it into your repository. You pass the specification to a repository method and it executes the specification and any framework works with it, right? It translates it all into uh, SQL for you. Uh, and then you get back your results just like you normally would. But now instead of having a bunch of Lambda expressions and link in your UI and in your infrastructure and all over your all over the place, all of that stuff is just in these specifications. So it, it's really good at encapsulating all that query logic in one place and putting it in a place that's very testable uh, in your system. All right, so that's that's the core project. That's it. That's what goes there. Um, now let's talk about the. Actually, now let's take a quick second and see if anybody has any questions. So we had one. Um, I think you touched on it or maybe covered it, but we'll bring it up to make sure. It's how do you view dependency diagrams of the existing project and identify the parts needing restructuring or refactoring? Um, if, if it's a lot of projects, that can be challenging. There are some tools in Visual Studio that will do that for you. Um, you can create a, a different, different diagrams, depending on which version of Visual Studio you have. Um, even the, the lowliest version of Visual Studio, you can go to any project and it'll show you its other project references. And so you can kind of, you know, draw out a, a diagram that says this one depends on that one, depends on the other one, um, and kind of see what that dependency structure is. Uh, so, you know, that's that's usually where I start. You know, most, most of the time you only have like three or four projects that are really part of the app um, for a simple app. Uh, for, for a legacy app, sometimes I see things that have 100 projects and, you know, sometimes they're, you know, 100 projects that we only use half of for, for a given app. Um, but, but still, it can take time to kind of figure out that whole hierarchy. But there is tooling in Visual Studio, and I can show you that when I get to the demo part, if you like. I think we have one more. I think you're going to cover this in your next set of slides. But yep. should I be accessing the database uh, via repository or specifications on the domain layer, or should it be delegated to the application layer? Yeah, the, you're going to abstract your data access here. And, and some of these interfaces in the core project might be for data access, like a, an iRepository or an iCustomer repository or something like that, that would be in the core. The actual way you do it um, is gonna be inside of your infrastructure layer that we'll get to next. All right, well, infrastructure they, project. they keep coming, let's see one more. Oh, yep. Jeremy and I are stepping each other's toes. I'm currently observing there's a tendency to create microservice per entity. I think this might be the entity service anti-pattern. How can we avoid this? I have not seen that. Microservice per entity seems like taking it a little too far. That's going to have nano services at that point. Um, yeah, it, at the at the most, it should be per aggregate, right? Um, so, so if you have like some tree uh, structure where you, you've got an order with order items, or an invoice with invoice items, or a customer with addresses, or whatever, right? That might be an aggregate that maybe makes sense to have a microservice for. Um, but usually, your microservices should maybe be a little bigger than that, in, in my experience. Um, how can you detect that or avoid it? Uh, well, you'll detect it if, if your microservices are very tightly coupled together. So let's say that we literally did it per entity, right? And so I have an order entity and I have an order item entity. Now I would generally make those be an aggregate, um, but let's say that we decided to make them separate microservices. How can I do anything with the order entity that isn't gonna have to query the order item entity, uh, microservice rather, all the time to get you know, the state of itself, right? To get its own uh, order items, it would have to talk to this other microservice. I can't ever deploy these things independently from one another. And that's, microservices are meant to be uh, independently deployable. So that'll be a big red flag when, when you see how tightly coupled they are. Um, you wanna be able to draw a line around your microservices and say, this is its responsibility. These are the things it does. This is the interface it presents to the rest of the world. And if it goes down, most of the rest of the system should still be able to work. Right, and if I if I need to deploy a new version of it, I can just do that, and the rest of the system just drives on. And and yeah, maybe there's some message queues that accumulate a few extra items in them while the system's coming up. Um, but the system doesn't just explode because one microservice is, is out of the picture for a moment. Um, that's the ideal, right? You can't always get there, um, but that should be what you're striving for. And so if you are building a system that has um, a bunch of, of microservices that all have to have real time, immediate, uh, synchronous communication with one another. 
all you're doing is making a, a distributed system um, that is basically a distributed monolith. Uh, and you're not getting the, the benefits of microservices, in my opinion. Would you right. create a new solution for each microservice? Sorry, I should let you ask these. Oh, no, you're good. Go ahead. <laughs> but yeah, I love, the, uh, I love the UI you've got for popping these up. That makes it easy. Um, yeah, I probably would. That's typically how I, I would do it. So each microservice generally gets its own solution. Um, we'll talk about how you can share code between them um, here in just a second. But, but ideally, you'd want each one to be self-contained. It should have its own model. It should have its own... Uh, solution, you know, your solutions don't need to be huge, right? For a microservice, especially like, remember the micro part of the name, um, your solution is going to be maybe three projects, um, a couple of NuGet references and some tests. Like that's it. You know, if you're in double digit projects for a microservice, then you're probably starting to get a little bit more in there than, than I would typically want. Um, you know, I've, I see sometimes they have like 10 or 12 and that's, that's, that's getting pretty high, I think. And if definitely, if you've got like 20 plus projects in a microservice, um, I think you're, you need to rethink the name of that. Uh, and it's no longer micro. All right. Well, I guess that's it for now. So thank you. All right. Um, let's talk about the infrastructure project. So the infrastructure project is where you put all the things that know the low level details about how something gets done. Right, so your abstractions, your interfaces, they are saying what? They're saying what needs to happen and how you do it is, is in the implementation of those interfaces. And if that how uh, needs to talk out of process, needs to talk to something other than your code, then you put it in the infrastructure project. And so things that go in here are repository implementations and the other things that they need to work. So if you're writing a repository and it talks to EF core or DB context, um, then that needs to go in infrastructure with it. Uh, if it needs to talk to Dapper, right, then there's going to be a NuGet reference to Dapper uh, in here. Um, if it needs to talk to an Azure SDK to communicate with Cosmos DB, that Azure SDK is a reference from the infrastructure project and nowhere else um, is how this should work. Uh, if you have, you know, caching on your repositories, there's a common uh, thing you can do with a decorator uh, that would go in here as well, typically, because it's relying on a cache that's going to be out of process, whether it's using Redis or an in-memory cache or whatever. Um, and, and usually you, you write that in such a way you can swap out whether it's a Redis cache or an in-memory cache or what have you. All right. Um, if you need to talk to other things over uh, web APIs or gRPC or whatever, you know, your clients would go here. So your, your web API client for talking to uh, the GitHub API, the Twitter API, the SendGrid API, whatever things you need to act as a client to, um, those would all go here. Um, anything that talks to the file system, things that uh, are logging adapters might go here. I'm talking specifically about logging adapters that have a dependency on external infrastructure. So, you know, you have a logger that knows how to uh, write directly to Azure App Insights or Azure Monitor, um, that would go here. Or one that writes directly to a file, that would go here. Um, you might have a logger that you use in your domain model, like say, Sarah Log, that does not have an intrinsic dependency on infrastructure and that you can still write unit tests for and it doesn't blow up because some, you know, connection string or file doesn't exist. Right, that's okay, right? That's that's purely in memory at that point. Um, and a lot of loggers have interfaces that you can use as well uh, to make it so you don't have that tight coupling. Um, but things that do need to talk to infrastructure should go here in infrastructure. Uh, sending emails or other messages would go here. Um, talking to the system clock, you know, you, it's very frequently that you'll have uh, implementation here. It's a really simple implementation. It's usually like one line of code, um, but if you've got conditional logic, you've got business logic that depends on the date or the time of day or things like that, then you're not going to be able to write tests that work 24 seven, right? You're going to have tests that only work at certain hours of the day, and then they break at other hours of the day. Um, and so those are much easier to write if you can use an abstraction, like an I date time or an I clock or whatever uh, interface, and then implement that inside of infrastructure. And you may have other services here. So um, there was a question earlier about, you know, which services would go where. Um, if you have services that depend on this infrastructure and, and work with it directly, and you can look at the, uh, the method signatures or the constructor dependencies on this service and see that they are not domain level, um, uh, level of abstraction, but they're talking about how stuff is actually being done, then they would go here. Right, so if you have some service that you know takes in, uh, I don't know, an, an Azure uh, data source and it returns back a SQL data reader, um, and you don't have any way to wrap that in, in some other interface, um, then that service would have to live here because its its signature, its its uh, definition depends on infrastructure concerns 
um, and that has to be kept inside this project. Otherwise, those dependencies will leak out uh, into the rest of your application and, and sort of infect them. Um, so you, you don't want to have that. And by that same note, um, you may have some interfaces in here. This should be fairly rare. But if you do have these types of services that have a signature, that have methods or, or return types or constructor arguments that are themselves infrastructure dependencies, um, then if you have interfaces that represent those classes, you know, and you've got an interface that returns back a, an Azure DB connection and, and takes in a, you know, something something specific to Azure, um, that interface would have to live here too for the same reason, right? Because the SDK where all that stuff is defined um, is a dependency of the infrastructure project and not your core domain model that shouldn't know anything about Azure. Because uh, next week you might run it on pure Docker and the week after that you might move it over to AWS, right? And it doesn't care about your host. Um, it just cares about the, the business logic. All right, so that's it for the infrastructure project. Any any questions on that? Uh, I believe we got we got one. Is DB context sometimes a sufficient abstraction or do you always introduce a repository interface? The DB context is not an abstraction at all, right? It's it's a DB context. It's an implementation. It's a how. Um, it says I'm going to you know track entities and you know check for changes and then give you a way to save them and manage all that and translate link into SQL and all that. It's it's totally implementation. That's the whole thing. Um, it does have some interfaces, but they're not your interfaces, right? They ship with the product, um, and so you can't you know map those to be exactly what you need. Um, the interface segregation principle says that clients should not depend on methods they don't use, right? And if you look at something like a, an IDB context or an IDB set, there's a lot of stuff on there. And I'll bet you're probably not using all of it on any given, you know, controller or, or domain service or something that might need it. So, um, so no, I, I would never, uh, if I'm following this approach, I would never have direct dependency on a DB context personally um, because of that, that uh, direct dependency on that implementation detail. Now, other folks might disagree with me, um, and, and there are some folks that think, well, you, you don't really need a repository. If you have a DB set, you know, it basically implements repository, and so, you know, you've checked the block. You're using that pattern. Everything's great. Um, and I think I think Tony already knows how I feel about this when, when he asked that, so he's just, like, teeing it up for me. Um, but, but the thing about the repository pattern um, is that it's the interface is the essence of the pattern, right? The fact that there is an abstraction that you own that's part of your domain model is what gives that, that pattern any benefits at all. Right? The fact that other things implement that pattern is an implementation detail. That's not giving you any benefit. Um, and so if you don't have the abstraction, then you aren't using the pattern, right? You know, you don't, you don't really have any benefit there. Um, and so that's, you know, the, the, the thing that a lot of folks overlook. Um, you can just use the DB context for everything, um, but now you're tightly coupled to the DB context, and that's you know that's fine for many applications, but it's not using the repository pattern. Um, one of the things that makes that harder, by the way, uh, is for instance doing a, a decorator that does a cached repository. That's trivial to do if you've got your own repository interface. It's it's certainly harder to do, not impossible, harder to do uh, in a flexible, loosely coupled way with using a decorator um, if you're using a DB context directly. All right. So one more. Uh, would background job processing such as hang fire, would that be included in here? Um, I don't know. Maybe. Uh, I have hosted services that do that type of thing in a lot of my systems. And I usually put the hosted service either as a standalone project um, that could be deployed uh, separately in its own container or as its own app service or something, um, or I run it on a different thread in the UI project itself, right? ASP.NET Core makes that really easy. So in the Pluralsight demo, um, we just have the hosted services that they need just running, uh, they, they fire off in, inside of startup.cs. Uh, so they don't have any scheduling stuff though, right? They just, they just run and they just uh, are checking event queues and stuff constantly. Um, so if I had hang fire and I wanted to put in scheduling rules and stuff, where would that live? Uh, I haven't used Hangfire in forever. I don't remember if it gives me any dependencies that would be hard to test. And that would be the, the biggest factor for me. If if I put Hangfire in my domain model in the core, um, does it make it so I have this dependency that's now difficult for to allow me to test my domain model? Um, does it in, introduce any dependencies on any kind of infrastructure? Like, uh, well, for Hangfire to work, you've got to have this config file and things like that. And, and I don't think it does, right? So I think... Um, you probably could put that wherever you needed to, but the the big guideline for for that library or any other library would be: Does it pull in any dependencies with it that are outside of your process, that are outside of your code, um, so that now you're depending on 
a database, a file system, a network call, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if it's not, then then you could probably pull that in as, as far up into the model as you're comfortable with, right? And so it would be fine to have an infrastructure. I'm sure there'd never be a problem with it there. Um, it could be in UI and it could even possibly be in your domain model if it was like a core part of how you did things and like everything about your domain was about scheduling and how stuff worked. <laughs> Okay. Um, speaking of domains, can the infrastructure layer react to domain events? Yeah, it can. Um, I use that frequently. Um, it it may be that you want your event handlers to be in your domain model and use interfaces. Like, let's say when an order is uh, shipped, um, we want to send a confirmation email to the user. Okay. Well, that is going to be you know the order is going to be an entity in the domain model. Um, and when we ship it, maybe that's uh, a method on an entity, or more likely it's probably like a domain service or something that, that runs and, and says we ship the thing. Okay, so this event fires off. Um, and so we have a handler somewhere that says, okay, given this order ID or this order entity, um, I need to send an email to the, to the user um, and let them know that this package is on the way. Okay, so the, the event itself, maybe it doesn't have all the details that that handler needs to do its job, right? It just says order ID one, two, three shipped. Right, that's what you know. So in the handler, you need to be able to go to the database and look up that order. Then you need to go and look up that customer. Then you need to look up their email. Um, maybe you need to go look up their profile and see if they opted into notifications. Then you need to build the email, which maybe you just do with some string logic right there, um, and, and send the email, right? Well, the sending the email needs an email sending thing, right? Whether you're using SMTP or SendGrid or whatever, right? Now that whole handler could live in your domain model which would be nice because then you could test it really easily. Um, but all those other things it needs to do, data access, email sending, uh, checking policies for, for you know, the customer, whatever, um, those are gonna use repositories and DB contexts and email senders that are defined with implementations in the infrastructure project. But I would, I would put as much as I was able to, I'd put the handler logic in, um, in the domain and, and then use dependency injection to plug in implementations of those interfaces from the infrastructure project. Now, does that mean I'd never put handlers in here? Uh, no, sometimes you can't because you know maybe you've got one of these one of these interfaces you need to work with that um, is tightly coupled to the Azure SDK or something like that, um, and you have to use it, right? In that case, sure, put the handler here. Uh, sometimes I'll put handlers in the UI, uh, which we'll see in a second in the UI project. Uh, it mostly when I want to do notifications back to the client using SignalR and Blazor and things like that. So. Um, in those situations, it makes sense sometimes to put handlers uh, in the UI project. But the, the general rule is if you can put the functionality in the core project and not break the other rules, like not depending on infrastructure, um, then you should do that, right? Put as much stuff in core as you can, as long as you don't break the rules and cause it to depend on stuff it shouldn't. Awesome. Well, thank you. All right. So that leaves us with the web project, right? There's only three projects here. It's a pretty simple architecture. Um, and so in the web project, you're going to put all your ASP.NET Core stuff, right? And so depending on which flavor of ASP.NET Core you're using, you're going to have controllers and views, or you're going to have razor pages, or you're just going to have APIs or API endpoints. Um, if, you're, if you're just building a backend for a mobile app or a, a single page application, React, Angular, Blazor, whatever you like. Um, you're going to have any type of DTOs that you need to use with these things. So these are going to be uh, your view models, your API models, your binding models, whatever you want to call them. They're the things that you... Uh, either bind to the UI or send, send over the wire as JSON or XML, um, and then also receive back uh, in the form of posts and puts and other things um, via your API or, or your controllers. Um, other uh, ASP.NET Core and MVC feature types are all going to live here. So your filters, your model binders, your tag helpers, your HTML helpers, those will all be in the web project as well. And if you have a lot of web projects and you want to share these between them, then they could certainly go into NuGet packages and then sh uh, have the NuGet package be referenced by the web project. That's fine. Um, but to the extent that you're going to have custom classes to do these things in this project, they should be in the web project. They shouldn't be in core because core shouldn't know anything about ASP.NET Core uh, or, or you know, whatever else it's using, right? It should be agnostic of your user interface decision. You might have other services here. You might have other interfaces here. These follow the same rules as the infrastructure ones, right? The reason why you would have services in the web layer um, and not in the domain layer, you know, the core project or the infrastructure project is because their uh, parameters or their return types use anything else you see on this slide, right? So if you have a service that returns back a view model, 
and the view model is defined in the web project, then the service has to be in the web project, right? That's that's just how it, how it has to work. Now, occasionally it will it'll make sense to take you know DTOs and pull them up into core um, so that you could pull those services up higher and make them easier to test or easier to reuse. Um, and that's that's a decision you can make sometimes. I, I'm certainly guilty of doing that occasionally for just for pure pragmatism. Um, but but generally, I would rather keep uh, UI specific concerns, including DTOs, out of my core domain model and and try and keep them in the web project, uh, just to give me that better separation. Okay. So, any questions about this one before I move on? This one's pretty straightforward. Um, yeah, we actually well, let's see. We do have a question though. All right. How do you model your entities so that you avoid cross avoid cross aggregate, or is cross aggregate a good thing? Not sure what he means by cross aggregate. Sithello seven. Um, so you avoid cross aggregate. I'm oh. guessing he means like this the aggregate, aggregate, this aggregate, and this aggregate both like have dependencies on each other's stuff. That's maybe what I'm getting. So I, I can imagine a scenario where like I've got an order and an order has some order items and you know I've got a customer and a customer has a bunch of addresses and the order needs to ship to an address, right? And you know, so how does how do we do that now that the order now depends on the addresses stuff and your address is part of the customer? Like I think maybe that's what he means and he can clarify if he if he wants. Um, but let's assume that's what he means. The answer is um, you can always use ID references for things between aggregates. And then you can go and get that ID through the root aggregate. So if I needed to have an order that depended on an address that lived under a customer, first of all, I would make sure I copied all that address detail to the order because once I ship the order, that, that address that I shipped it to is, is you know, not changing anymore. So if the customer deletes their, their favorite address or changes their preferred shipping address to something else, that should not change what I just sent that order to, right? So, so there shouldn't be that, that persistent reference. Um, but even in terms of like, a, you know, when I'm creating the order, grabbing that address, um, it shouldn't be an entity relationship. It shouldn't be a navigation property, um, but it could be an ID. Right. It could be that, you know, this is order number one, two, three, and it is for customer number four, five, six, and it is using their address number seven, eight, nine. Right. And so now I can build the order from that. And when I go to ship it, I can pull the details of address seven, eight, nine, and I can say, I ship this order to street one, street two, city, state, zip, country. Um, and, and now I know exactly where it went. Um, and that's, you know, locked in place for that order and no longer dependent in any way on that customer. All right. Well, if if you have anything else, feel free to clarify or drop more questions in the comments and I'll relay them. All right. OK, so what if you have other things that you want to share between solutions? And so in uh, domain driven design, you have this this concept called a shared kernel. And it's basically the way you do that. It's the way you take um, things that should be reused between different applications or bounded contexts or solutions um, and, and put them uh, in a place where they can be shared. Right now, these follow all the same rules as the core projects, but even more so. Like you should be even stricter about this in terms of referencing dependencies, um, like like infrastructure concerns. Um, ideally, these should be distributed as NuGet packages. Uh, if you don't already have an internal NuGet feed uh, for your organization, I would encourage you to check it out. Um, GitHub supports it. Azure DevOps supports it. Uh, a file share will act as one uh, in a pinch if you need one. Um, it's really pretty easy to set up an internal NuGet feed. And once you do, then it makes the perfect place to put this type of thing. Um, what goes in the shared kernel? You might have uh, common base types for all these different uh, patterns that you might be following. So base entities, base domain events, base specifications. You might have common exceptions or interfaces that you use. Uh, you might have uh, authentication, maybe how you do dependency injection you want to put in here, like helpers or libraries or things like that. Uh, if you're using consistent logging everywhere, that could go here. If you have common guard clauses for common business concerns that every application or every microservice needs to know about, um, they could go here. So you know, maybe your, your whole system only works for members or subscribers or something like that, right? So you have some guard clause that all over the place you're checking, is this a valid subscriber, right? That guard clause could live in a shared kernel so that you're not having to copy it and duplicate it across every solution. Um, if you don't know what a guard clause is, well, here's here's a bad example of something that does not use a guard clause, where you have a fairly simple method and it does what it should and it checks its inputs before it performs its operation. And so it says, hey, if the order's not null and if the customer's not null, then go ahead and process the order. Otherwise, say that the customer was null. Otherwise, say that the order was null, right? And so this is a big, long, convoluted way 
of doing defensive programming and verifying things are good, right? But um, it's not very readable because the actual work is is here hidden inside of all this conditional complexity. Um, and so what you would prefer is to fail fast, right? Do the checks up front like this and say, hey, if this is an all throw, if that is an all throw, and then from here on down, I've checked, right? So I don't need any if statements after that. I don't have any else clauses at all. Um, everything is just, just works at that point because you've done all the checks up front. Um, and if you see that you're doing a lot of that and it's a lot of duplicate logic and maybe it's not always consistent and sometimes you change the exception and you don't throw it the same way or you don't give the name of the thing the same way, um, you can use uh, a NuGet package. Like I have a, a free one out there on, on NuGet called our Dallas Guard Clauses. It has a bunch of these things built in um, and it'll let you do this uh, pretty easily as well. All right. So um, check that out if you're, if you're interested, if, if you see that pain in your applications now. All right, so with that, with all those four projects that we're talking about, we haven't gotten to test yet, but we will in a second. Um, you basically have three main projects for your system. You have your web project, which is your UI. You have your infrastructure project, which is everything that talks to other things outside of your uh, code, and you know, out of process, out of out of memory, out of out of your code while it's running. Um, and then you have your core project, which is where as much of your stuff should go as you can get in there, um, as long as you follow those rules that it doesn't take a dependency now on some infrastructure. All right, then core depends on shared kernel, which should be mostly abstractions, right? It should be mostly base types, interfaces, things like that. Um, definitely not uh, depending on infrastructure concerns. Now, if you look at the arrows here, the arrows all represent dependency, um, mostly uh, compile time dependency, right? And then at runtime, you need to somehow tell the web project where all the implementation details are for the infrastructure. And so you need to, at least at runtime, make sure that you pass in the infrastructure DLL to the web project so it can stitch all that together um, with its dependency injection uh, tooling. Now, you can just have a compile time reference on infrastructure, and, and usually that's what you do. Uh, it just makes your life easier. But I just want to point out that that's optional. Right? You don't have to have a project reference on infrastructure in your solution. Um, you can literally, when you when you build, you can tell Visual Studio as a post build action, um, copy the DLL from infrastructure's bin folder into the web bin folder, and then everything works. Right? As long as you tell your your dependency injection to load that that assembly, um, and so you know that would make it so that it's very difficult for someone to accidentally. Uh, you know, take a dependency on a DB context or something in the middle of a controller when, you know, they shouldn't be, right? So it, it makes it really easy uh, to keep developers from doing the wrong thing. It helps them, you know, fall into the pit of success, makes the wrong thing hard, the right thing easy, all that good stuff. Um, all right. Then you might have some tests. You might have unit tests for core, right? Core is designed to be incredibly easy to unit test because it has no dependencies. And the thing that makes unit tests really painful and difficult is when they have dependencies on the user interface or on the database or on the network. Um, if you don't have any of that stuff, it turns out that code is usually pretty easy to unit test and they run really fast and you can write lots of them really easily. Um, and that is all good things. Uh, you're gonna have some functional tests, which are a special type of integration test that you can run against your web system. And in ASP.NET Core, this is incredibly easy, especially if you're building APIs, there is no excuse for you not to be writing these types of functional tests because they're like four lines of code and, and they can test everything about the, the endpoint, right? They test the routing, they test the exception handling, they test the model validation. Um, all the stuff about MVC and ASP.NET Core uh, gets verified in these tests as well as all the logic inside your application. Um, so they're they're really nice and, and will save you a lot of uh, problems from being shipped. And then integration tests, you know, that are more like low level that are like, hey, can I take this entity? Can I send it to my data persistence? And then can I fetch it back out? Um, those type of tests uh, would live mostly targeting infrastructure. Now, you might also have integration tests that hit other things. You might have unit tests for other things too, but this is mainly how your tests are gonna work out with this architecture. Okay, so that's that's the whole picture, right? That's basically seven projects that you need for a given solution, one of which is shared. So it's it would be in its own separate solution. That's the shared kernel. Um, so six projects is what you would need per application or per microservice if you're following this, this architecture. Um, in, a, in a folder structure, it might look something like this. Uh, so you've got your, you know, your source folders. Um, this is borrowed from how .NET Core itself organizes its source code. So typically they have a source folder with all the real code, and then they have a test folder where all the test code lives. Um, and so inside of source, you have your three projects, core, infrastructure, web, and then in a test folder, you've got your various types of, of tests. Um, 
Any questions about this before I, I move on? Nope, looks like we're good to move on. All right. Um, and apologies if this is going longer than uh, than typical, but uh, I figure it's virtual. And if, if you lose interest, you can always take off, and, and this will be on YouTube later. So um, I figure I'd rather give you too much content than, than cut you short. All right. So let's talk for a brief moment about how we organize the stuff that happens inside the individual actions or, or handlers or whatever you want to call them um, inside your ASP.NET Core app, because this also ties into how you want to organize your code. All right, so a, in general, an action in an MVC app or a handler in a Razor page uh, needs to accept some type, right? It needs to validate it and make sure it's good, right? So it can use model validation. Maybe it does that with a filter, uh, which is automatic if you're using the API controller uh, filter in ASP.NET Core. Um, then it does whatever it's going to do, which is the part we're going to talk about. Um, then it creates some kind of a, an object off, often for the response if it needs one, um, and it sends it right with a response type, whether it's a view or a page or an OK or whatever it might be, right? And so that's generally every single endpoint in your app is going to look like this. Um, and so when we look at that do work step in the middle, you've already done model validation. You've got whatever they sent you. Um, there's a few different ways you can do that work, and they, they operate at different levels of abstraction. Um, and none of them are, are necessarily right or wrong. They all have trade-offs, right? And so the simplest one, if you're if you're following clean architecture and if you're not just hard coding against the DB context, the simplest one is to inject in an interface for a repository um, and, and then work with your entities directly, right? And so this is great for simple operations. It's perfect for CRUD work where you're just, you know, grabbing something, changing its state, and then saving it or deleting a record or creating a new record. And there's not a lot of business logic around all that. Um, does require mapping between web models um, and the domain model inside the controller because uh, you don't want to be sending your, your domain model types over the wire um, or accepting them over the wire as, as a post or a put. Um, and so you, you do need to do that, that DTO translation inside the controller with this approach. Okay, so here um, is an example of what this might look like. Uh, in this case, we're going to go fetch an item from a repository, and we're going to call a method on that item because we don't have an anemic domain. We actually have methods on our entities that we call to do things. Uh, and so we call the mark complete method um, that's actually going to change the state, but also maybe do other things. Maybe it raises an event. You know, maybe it has other logic. Um, and then after we've made that change to that entity state, we're going to update its uh, state in persistence using that repository again to save it. And then we return OK. Everything works. Um, now, this is missing a few little bits, like maybe if we don't find the thing, we want to return a 404 uh, or something like that. So there could be additional logic here. Um, but just to keep this really simple, this is what uh, this could look like. Now, if it gets more complicated than this, if it's working with several entities and they're doing different things and they have to interact in some way, then it might make sense to introduce a service so that your controller doesn't have a lot of low-level logic. Pretty much if your controller has a bunch of if logic inside the actions, that's telling you that it's doing too much. Right, you're better off to, to get that stuff out of the controller. You want your controller actions to be tiny, like you know, like a couple lines of code at, at most, right? Um, and so this is about as much complexity as you want inside an individual controller action. Um, so option two, which will help pull some of that logic out of the controller, is to introduce a service, right? Usually called an application service. This is going to be in in my model. This would typically live in the web project because it's going to be accepting and returning types that are uh, API models or view models or other types that are defined in the web project, right? And so you pass an API model to the service, it does whatever it's going to do, and then it returns a, a model back to the controller, which in turn returns a result, right? So that is better for more complicated things. It, it does a good job of keeping your controller lightweight, um, and it can make it so your controller has fewer dependencies, right? So if the controller had to do stuff that dealt with multiple different entities working together, it might have to have multiple different repositories to do that work. Um, if you introduce an application service, maybe the application service has multiple repository dependencies, but the controller just has one, right? Just has the service, and that's it. So the code in that case would get a little simpler, a little smaller, and it would look something like this. Now you can imagine somewhere there's a controller constructor that's taking in this app service, you know, through an interface and dependency injection and all that. Um, but inside of this action method, it's just doing this one thing, right? It's just calling the app service to do mark complete. Um, and this is a pretty common approach, um, but it does mean that every controller is still going to be a unique snowflake and have different sets of dependencies that it needs. 
if you have a lot of different actions on your controller, your uh, constructor is probably going to have a bunch of different dependencies. And if you see a controller that has like five or six or 10 different dependencies being injected into it, that's a red flag, right? That's telling you that you're breaking single responsibility principle, you're doing too many different things, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so another option that's very popular now is to use something like Mediator um, to make it so that your controllers get super thin and super lightweight. Um, and so you take an API model, you create a command out of it, you send it with Mediator, and then you have a separate piece of code somewhere in its own class that is a handler for that command and does the actual work. Um, and so that would look something like this, where inside of this same mark complete method, um, I did change it here to be async because Mediator is async, uh, but other than that, it hasn't really changed. So now we're going to take that item ID that's being passed in, we're going to create a new type out of it, which is this command, and we're going to send it with Mediator. Okay, so now if I do this with all my controllers and all my actions, every single controller's constructor looks the same. They all just take in a mediator. That's it. Right? They don't need any repositories. They don't need any services. They don't need anything else. Uh, in fact, I could create a base controller that has mediator as a property um, and make sure that that gets set up by my DI container. And now I don't even need a constructor on any of my controllers. They all just use the base controller, use its property, and, and you're good, right? And so you don't even have to have any dependencies in your controllers. Um, it's all done through the base type and everything uses mediator. Hallelujah. All right. So um, you can take this even a step further because three lines of code is just too much. Um, let's make it so it's only two because we can leverage model binding to create that command for us. Um, and so we just ask for the command that we need through the, the parameter itself. Model binding will give us that as long as we name the properties on that command appropriately. And then all we have to do is send it right now. At this point, you're wondering, why do we even need to have this action method? Right. All it's doing is just routing. Right? It's just taking whatever comes in and routing it to another file to actually do the work. Um, and so if you're thinking that, you're right. Uh, and that's why you should just throw this away and just use the API endpoints project um, that I've got out there on GitHub because it makes it so you can do all that and you don't even have to have mediator. So I'll show you that in a minute. But this is a lot of teams that, that aren't using API endpoints. They're already using mediator, perhaps for other things, in which case that's great because mediator can do more than just this. Um, it's, it's a really good approach that a lot of folks are using. All right, let's look at eShop on web uh, as a sample. Um, and, and since I'm already over time, actually, I'm not going to look at it, but I'm going to tell you, hey, you could go look at eShop on web as a sample. Um, and then I'm going to talk about my clean architecture template here. Uh, it's out there on GitHub. You can, I'll show it to you in a second in Visual Studio, but here's the URL, you know, github.com or Dallas clean architecture. Um, it's updated for .NET 5. Um, Man, yeah, and you'll see it in a second. Um, it does have a, its own uh, solution template that you can use. There's there's one for Visual Studio that gets updated periodically. I'm not sure how recent it is. Um, the the one here that's through NuGet is is more commonly updated, so it's more likely to be up to date with the latest and greatest. Um, and you can just say .NET new and then pass in your project name. So if your company is you know Acme and your project name is I don't know. Foo, then you could just say, you know, it's dot that new clean arch dash o acme dot foo, and it will create that. And that'll be your namespace, and all your project names will be appropriate, et cetera. Um, and then our Dallas API endpoints, uh, we'll talk about it briefly as well. Um, it's actually being used inside the clean architecture, so we'll see it there. Any questions while I bring this up? So, one quick one. Let's see. Uh, and I actually have this question too. Yeah. Have some col uh, colleagues who prefer domain project over core. Any opinion? Um, that'd be fine. Yeah, you can call it domain if you want. I use core mostly uh, because Jeffrey Palermo, basically with his onion architecture, that's what he called things at the center was core. Um, if you look at uh, the eShop on web, uh, you can't see it here, but um, if you were to go look at eShop on web, you'd see that it's it's central project is called application core. Um, and that's because it was coming out just as Microsoft had decided that they were going to name ASP.NET's next version core. Um, which, you know, never really made sense because you knew it wasn't always just going to be this core subset of ASP.NET. It was going to get bigger. And, and they realized that too. And that's why now we have .NET 5. Um, but uh, yeah, so yeah, I wouldn't mind if it were called domain. Um, I just call it core because it's shorter and that's that's what I've always used. Awesome. Thanks. Okay. Um, let's, let's pull Visual Studio up here. Uh, this is the clean architecture solution template, right? And so the idea with this is that you would do that .NET new, in fact, let's just do that um, instead of talking about it. You would do that .NET new thing, and we'd go over to like some scratch folder like this one that you can't see, but you will in a second. And we go into PowerShell, 
and we say dot net new clean arch dash o um, Baton Rouge like that, and it says boom. That's not there. What? All right, that was a horrible demo. That's why I should practice my demos first. Um, yeah, I must have to reinstall it. Let me see if I can do that. I want to. I want to see if see if my docs actually work on this thing. So let's go to GitHub, come Dallas, clean architecture. On the fly, we're going to install this thing right here with .NET new install. Copy that in there. Do that. I know I've used this before on this machine, so it must just be since I updated the SDK, it must have killed it. And then do it again. Woohoo! All right, so now it worked. So then if I go to that and we say uh, at, hopefully I spelled that right. You like this rogue baton. Um, we'll look at this one, right? Which is not, not exactly the one that's out there, um, but really, really close, right? This is the one that's built from a template. Uh, and, and so you can see it's got the solution name. It's got all the project names are, are what you would expect. Um, there is a uh, shared kernel, stop that. There is a shared kernel project in here that you would rip out and put that into its own uh, thing. Um, but the idea with this is that it's it's just got all the things organized correctly. It's not a sample application. It's a solution template. So it has a minimal amount of stuff um, that you might want. I did not create separate templates for an API project, a Razor Pages project, an MVC project, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, because that's just too much work. So um, if you're building a, a controller view project, then you need the controllers and the view models and the views. So you just delete everything else. If you only need APIs and API models, you keep the APIs, you delete everything else. Um, and so it's, it's up to you to just throw away the stuff you don't need. Um, but there's not a whole lot there, right? So if you look at the controllers, there's like two. Uh, if you want to see endpoints, they're, they're here. Um, so it does have a minimal domain model for you to see just how things are stitched together. So there's an aggregate called a project. Inside a project, there is a project aggregate root, uh, which is marked with an aggregate root interface to enforce uh, persistence to only work with that. Um, and then it has a collection of to-do items, right? So you basically define a project, say, I've got a bunch of things I've got to get done. I'm going to give it a name as a project. That's a container for all the to-do items. And then the status of the project depends on the status of all the to-do items. When all the items are done, the project is done, right? So a uh, pretty simple domain, but enough that you can kind of see how the patterns work out. Now, if you're using aggregates, then they make a nice place to uh, combine other things inside your model, like events that apply to that aggregate, like new item added or item completed, um, handlers for those domain events, specifications for how you're gonna search for things um, might belong in there. Uh, and so when you have a larger, more realistic system that has a bunch of different aggregates, you have a different folder at the root of core for each one of those aggregates. It makes it really easy to find things. Um, instead of having you know one project that has like every specification or every repository, or not, not project, one folder, right? Those get huge. Um, so let's talk about endpoints for a second. The way endpoints work is instead of having a controller with a bunch of actions like this one, right? Here's my controller. Um, and it only has the, the one the one action. That's because most of the work's been done by these other endpoints. Um, but you could imagine if this had uh, action methods for create and update and add an item and delete an item and blah, 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 right? This would get very long. Um, instead, the items uh, or the uh, endpoints over here are for each one of those operations. And so um, the way you create an endpoint is you just inherit from a base endpoint type. And then you use this fluent generics pattern to specify your request and your response, right? Your your command and your, you know, whatever response is coming back. Um, and so these are optional, right? So you could say dot without a request and you could say dot without a response if you wanted to. Um, but basically these produce a generic handle method um, that uses those types, right? And so your request maps to the, uh, the parameter coming in on the, on the handler. Um, which is basically your action method. Uh, and then the response is the response coming back, right, from your action result. Uh, so in here, when you say, hey, create a project, it says, okay, new up a project, um, create the, the thing in the repository, generate a response, and return it. 
Uh, now, if I wanted to use an application service for this instead, then I would just take all this code here, put it inside of the service, um, and this thing would be like one line of code. Uh, and so that, that would be how that works. Now, the other thing to notice about this is when you're doing stuff with traditional MVC, um, you typically have to touch things all over the place, right? So uh, I need to add a new endpoint. Well, what do I do? Well, I, it's a project endpoint. Okay, well, I'll go to the project and I'm going to add the thing here. Okay, well, um, I need to have a model for that. I need to have a model for what they pass in and a model for what they pass out. All right, well, now I got to go find another folder and I got to go find the project view model um, and, and mess with that, right? And maybe I've got an API model here where it's got a project DTO. And so I'm, I'm all over the place inside my project um, and if this is big at all, right, I'm scrolling because there's going to be a whole lot of different folders and things here. Um, if you've used Razor Pages before, the really nice thing about Razor Pages is inside a page, like this home page, this index page, right, the code for it is right here, right? They're chained together and you just, you know, they're right there, right? You don't have to scroll. You don't have to go anywhere. The same thing is true with these endpoints, right? The Razor Pages was the inspiration for this. So you want to know what the request looks like? It's right here, right? And this is where the route is defined. Um, this is handy when you're testing it because now the route is in a place that you can get to. Uh, instead of a magic string in a controller, the route is is in a constant that you can get from a from a test. Um, and what's the response? Well, it's right here, right? So they're they're grouped together and they're really easy to find. Even if you're using VS Code, these still sort together, right? So create, create, create. These things all appear together in other IDEs, not just in Visual Studio. Um, but in Visual Studio, you do get this nice chaining thing. Um, let's look at one that doesn't have a response. Um, like delete. So delete only has a request, um, but by convention, it returns a 204 no content. Um, and so it's without a response. And so that's what this will do. This just returns no content um, after it does its delete. So, so that's how that works. Um, I do want to talk about one more thing and then I'll just answer questions and, and scroll around and show you stuff. Uh, and that is functional tests. So functional tests, if I want to do like project get by ID, um, here's what this test looks like. And uh, so you have to have a, a web application factory where you configure your dependencies. And so you tell it, hey, I want to use this in-memory data source or this SQLite data source or whatever uh, for my tests instead of a real database um, and, and not much else, right? That's, if we go look at this, that's what this is doing. Is it's saying, okay, go create a scope, get the DB context, um, use uh, somewhere, somewhere it's deciding to use a web provider, um, but also it's seeding the data, right? So the main thing this is doing is uh, getting the DB context and using that to seed the data so that every test has um, some sample data in it. Um, and that's that's pretty much the whole thing. Um, trying to see, oh, there it is. Here's the in-memory. There's, there's where it's setting up for in-memory. All right, the other thing this does is it says, hey, mediator, don't do anything, right? So it just turns off mediator for the purpose of these uh, these tests. That That's optional based on what you're doing. Okay, so then in here, when I want to make a test, I just build the route that I want to use. And that's that's all uh, strongly typed because it's using that route that's inside of the, the request. Um, and then it just says client, go go fetch that and deserialize it. So this is using a, a helper method. This get and deserialize is a, a helper method from my HP client test extensions NuGet package. Um, and then I can just assert what I get back. So if we take this and we run it, hopefully it works. So fast. This has never been built yet, so it takes a second. All right. There you go. Green check mark. That's good. Okay. So then we can put a, a breakpoint here and debug it. And you'll be able to see that it, we get a strongly typed project ID response um, that comes back from this. And so this var uh, is, in fact, this get project by ID response DTO that's been deserialized. And we can, you know, check it out and see like, here's all its stuff and it's got a, this items collection and here's all the records and blah, blah, blah. Um, so it, it works really nice and it's really easy. And each test is trivially small. Um, this would be even smaller if I weren't doing all these assertions. So, um, yeah, there's, there's, like I said, there's no excuse not to write these tests for your API endpoints. Um, we'll just run it. By default, it already has the web project set as the startup and it looks like this. Gives you some documentation on how it works. Um, you can click this link to go see Swagger and see how all this stuff works. Um, everything, whether you're using controllers or API endpoints, it works the same. Uh, so here's your thing with projects using a controller. This is an API controller. Um, here's projects using endpoints that we were just looking at. 
Um, I didn't implement everything one for one, but they basically work the same. Uh, and so you can go in here, you can get a list of all the projects and run it and say, look, there's a project. Um, you can go get a specific project to see all its items. So you can say get project number one. And this is what we just saw a test for. So there you can see there's all my projects. You can see they're not done. The to-do items are, are not done yet. So you can go hit other endpoints to, to mark them complete and basically build a to-do app out of this if you wanted to. Uh, that's not included. Um, all right. So any questions about anything? Clean architecture, API endpoints, GitHub, solution templates, testing. Let's see. So far, uh, nothing's really coming in, but I imagine some people are probably typing. So while we wait, uh, yeah, I want to thank you so much for coming out and doing this. Um, let's see. We got some shout outs to eShop on web. I know I've use that we've used it at work as examples that's a fantastic fantastic project if you want to check it out um i don't know if we have anything else i have a, a ddd question if you're okay with that yeah totally so um one of the things that we've kind of talked about and i think you mentioned it a little bit earlier with raising domain events and having things in the in the infrastructure project actually subscribe to them mm -hmm. but is there a case where let's say uh a domain object actually takes a dependency on some type of service and how do you handle that? Um, okay. So you have like an entity that wants to depend on a service. So the example I've, I read it in a book a while back is basically like a model wants to validate itself saying that it doesn't have foul language in the text and it has to subscribe to a third party service to call out to that. But the model wants to keep itself its state, correct mm -hmm. and validate on itself. So how would you handle a situation like that as far as getting that dependency into the model itself? Sure, sure. So there's a few different ways you can do it. And I've got an example. There's, there's a lot of ways you can do this. Um, let me see if I can find it real quick. So go out here, turn off caps lock. Um, I have a DDD no duplicates repo, which I think is called what I just said. Let's see, DDD no duplicates. And so the idea with this is that you've basically, you've, you've got an example in yours where it's foul language and it has a list of words that wants to get from some service to like say, hey, you can't say that. Um, in this one, it's it's kind of the same idea. There's there's a, an external dependency we want to validate on. And in this case, it's uniqueness, right? So like it's Twitter. And when you create a new account on Twitter, it has to be unique, right? You can't create another username someone already has. Um, and so the model needs to be able to verify that somehow, right? But the model can't do that by itself because it needs to know about all the other IDs that are out there. Um, and so there's 11 different ways that I'm showing how to do that in this this uh, GitHub repo that you can grab and, and look at. Um, and I have a, an article in the README talks about it, um, but you know you could do it in the database, right? And so you could do it in your scenario, you could do it in the database. You could say, I'm not even gonna put it in the model. Let's say I've got a store procedure, right? I'm gonna use the store procedure to save the thing. And in the store procedure, it's gonna go look at this other table um, and look for bad words and then do a, a, a like, statement or whatever inside the thing you're, you're inserting and blow up if it finds bad words, right? So that would be like just, just lean on the database approach. Um, you could use a domain service. And in a domain service, what you would do, uh, you'd have this, this product service. And the service, in this case, it's going to go do a check to see if they're, if they're unique. Um, and so here it might say, go list me all the things where the name is equal to the name that someone's trying to use now. Um, and if we find any, uh, then throw an exception that says it's duplicate. Right now, you can imagine in your case, you might have this bad word service that you inject in and it would say, well, if any of the things that are in my code uh, match the list of bad words in the service or, or if I pass, you know, the thing they're trying to update to the service and I get back a, a status code that says it's, it contains offensive language, um, then I'm going to throw an exception. Right. Otherwise, go ahead and do my work and, and update it. Right. So you could do it with with a service, with a, an interface that you would inject in. Uh, this this is an implementation because it's it's not an I product repository, but it would work the same if it were an interface. Um, and then your implementation would be the actual service, right? So then in, when you're testing, you could have your own service that just reads from, you know, a hard coded list of strings, let's say. But then at runtime, you could go talk to the external service that has like every bad word from every language ever and lead speak and whatever else, right? Um, so that would be another option, right? That's a really simple one. Um, and you could pass all the data you need to the method. Right, so in product, when I say update the name, or in your case, you know, update the text that might have bad words in it, I'm going to pass in all the other things that it can't have. 
right? Either the other product names, all of them, um, or all the bad words, right? And then I'll do the work in here uh, to do it. Now, your service you're using might not give you an API endpoint that actually lists all of the bad words, right? Probably it doesn't. Um, but if it did, or if you had all of those in a database table, you could do this. Um, I don't necessarily like this solution, but but it's an option and it works. Mm -hmm. um, and, and on and on, right? So how would I do it? These last few are typically how I would do it, um, either using an aggregate or using domain events. Um, I'm, I'm leaning against throwing exceptions from domain events, uh, which I think is what this one does. Um, but, but it is an option that works. So on product, what we could do is we could say, um, update the name to a new name and raise an event right here. Um, and this is using mediator basically directly here. Uh, and so this is a, a non-async method uh, that's doing this evil stuff you should never do, but it was just a demo um, to, to go talk to mediator using async and so in getting get a waiter, get result um, and goes to see, hey, can I make this request? So when that fires, it fires off a product name change requested, uh, and that goes to this product name change handler, and it goes and says, well, go get me all the names uh, and verify that if it's one of them, then it's a duplicate, um, and throws an exception, right? This is the part I'm saying I don't like. Um, I don't think domain events should throw exceptions anymore. I used to say this was a good plan, but um, I, I've come around and decided that if you want to do that behavior, you should use a command, not an event. Um, so you could still do this. I would just do it with a command, not an event. Um, and, and so then this would blow up and it wouldn't work if it was duplicate or if it had bad words. Um, otherwise it would proceed, right? So those are uh, some different ways that you can approach this. Awesome, thanks. So we do have a few more questions coming in. So what about endpoint authorization? Wait, yeah, authorization, whatever. Right. <laughs> Would yep. you use authorize or push the logic down? Um, I use the authorize most of the time. Um, so I'll put that on a base uh, class typically, um, or uh, you you can even add it globally inside of startup.cs when you configure uh, ASP.NET Core MVC, you just say, add this as a global filter. Uh, and then anywhere that you want to punch through it, um, you can add a, a allow anonymous, right? So like a typical web formsy or, or MVC view style of app, maybe the login page is like the only thing you can get to if you're not authenticated and then everything else you have to be logged in. Um, that type of scenario works pretty well. For, uh, for APIs, usually you need some kind of a token for just about every API endpoint, um, except maybe like the token endpoint itself. If you're using something like Auth0 or Identity Server or something like that, that stuff's probably gonna be in a different place anyway. Right? It's probably never gonna be part of your app. Um, and so it'll just redirect there when necessary. Uh, and so you can literally just add a global filter that, that specifies that you always need um, to have a valid JOT token in order to access it. Uh, and then and then you just do that once in, in startup and you don't even have to do it in your controllers or your endpoints. Awesome, all right, this one may be a mouthful. Let's see, how do you prevent developers from doing something on the infrastructure when the web has the reference to the infrastructure project during development? Sure, so I mentioned that, and, and they're talking about this right here. So in the package, I've got this reference to Baton Rouge uh, infrastructure. Um, and in startup at the moment, uh, you can see I have this using statement that's using Baton Rouge infrastructure. So this one um, does not show how to do it with without that that project reference. Um, I think I have another GitHub repo that shows how to do it. Um, but basically, well, let, me, let me show you what you would need to do here. Um, inside of web properties, you would go into post build. So is it build events? Yeah, post build command line, and you would edit this, and you would say something like copy dot dot whack baton rouge dot infrastructure, you know, yada 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 slash bin slash version slash foo whatever, um, and then infrastructure, you know, dot dll to you know bin right whatever whatever that folder is. So you you gotta get all these paths right, but you do this essentially, and when you build. Um, you, you don't have the project reference and instead it runs out and it grabs all the stuff it needs and it brings it over and copies it, all the stuff being like literally that one DLL typically, um, and drops it into your web project so that at runtime it can load it. Uh, and then inside your startup, instead of having this strongly typed direct reference to it, um, and in configure services, you're wiring up all these types. So if I, you know, if I comment this out and we'll see what, what turns red, right? We'll add DB context um, is red and the default infrastructure module is red. Uh, this default infrastructure module 
Um, I think I'm using Autofac for that, right? Yeah, so this is using Autofac. So with Autofac, what I could do is instead of registering a module and strongly typing it, I could say um, how to go register that module by going and fetching it from another assembly. Um, and I don't have the code for that handy, but basically you would say load the load the assembly, load the module from the assembly right here. Let me see if there's IntelliSense for this. Is there a register assembly or register, yeah, register assembly modules. All right, so I'd say something like register assembly modules for Baton Rouge, you know, dot infrastructure, All right? And it would find that DLL, uh, or maybe I have to do type of or something, or I have to make make this code right. Um, but it would look at this DLL in the bin folder and load this module um, using late binding, basically, uh, instead of early binding. Um, and then the reason why that will work is because all of the actual wire up of infrastructure is in a module in the infrastructure project. So we go over here and we look at this default module, like everything you need to know about how to wire things up uh, is, is in here. So like wiring up repositories and what their scope is, wiring up mediator, um, setting up this, this service factory, setting up all the mediator handlers, all that stuff is in this module. Um, and so you don't have to uh, specify all this stuff in your web project. Um, you can you can put the things appropriate to each module in them. Um, and so you, know, you don't have to do it exactly like this. You don't have to use Autofact. You don't have to use modules. Um, but you do have to use some type of reflection at startup in order to load that assembly um, in a late bound way so that you can do dependency injection off the types that are in that other assembly instead of having a project reference. Um, and I have a blog post that talks about this more if I can find it real quick. So it's our Dallas reference infrastructure without project reference. And I Google for my own blog all the time. Um, and here's here's two. One's, uh, well, one's an eShop issue, which I don't remember if I answered. Um, but yeah, this one should be the one. So it's, it's old. Uh, this might be pre.net. Yeah, this is this is pre.net core, um, and it's using registries, which are structure maps equivalent to a module. Um, but yeah, you can look at this. Uh, let's see, let's post this in the comments. I don't know if it'll let me. Uh, I'll post it in a private chat, and somebody else can post it to the comments. There, there you go. go. We can handle that for you. Um, but yeah, if you search for something like this, maybe I covered it in this issue on eShop. Um, do, 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 do. Yeah, I don't know. I got to see if I actually have a, a good reference for core. I thought I did at some point, but maybe it's still in my blog backlog. Um, but yeah, you, that's that's the gist of how you do it as far as the detailed code of how to do it. Um, I'd have to look for it. Okay, awesome. So another one from Tony. So follow up question, although a bit off topic. How do you write automated tests for endpoints using token based security? Right. Um, that's a good question. Um, there's a few different ways you can do that. So let's say we have an API endpoint that that has uh, you know a need for that security, and I've got GitHub repo for this too. I just got to try and find it. Basically, I have GitHub repos for everything. Um, let me see if I have one that's, that responds to a search for JWT. That that would be the only thing I can think of I would search for. Uh, oh, uh, API maybe. Identity, oh, that might be it. Oh, that's private. I probably can't show that. Um, test secure API sample. That sounds like what we want. All right. <laughs> um, there we go. So we want to be able to have a token secured API endpoint and dynamically test it. All right. So let's look at this thing goes. Secure API test, test API endpoints. Um, there's a few ways you can do it. One is to just rip out the security. So in your uh, test server thing, you can just say allow anonymous, you know, add an allow anonymous uh, filter, and then everything gets through, right? That's kind of cheating, um, but it will work if, if you don't need it otherwise. Um, this one has code to actually get an access token in your code. Um, and so this will go and, and actually use identity server uh, type logic, uh, to go get a, a token endpoint, use the identity model with OIDC stuff, have a spa client, go fetch Alice, Alice. Those are pretty standard identity server uh, types. Um, and then and then do its thing, right? So here, uh, there's a test to verify you can get the token. Here's the API endpoint. It says, go get the token, set the bearer token, get the response, et cetera, et cetera, and it works. So um, I'll send you this up, oh, someone beat me to it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and you know what? What are the odds this thing actually works, right? Um, it's one thing to show you on GitHub, but let's see, it's two years old. 
could it possibly still work? I don't know. Let's let's find out. So we'll come over here and we'll dot that out of that and we'll say git clone that and we'll cd that. No, that one. And we'll do dot net. Oh, look at that. There's a run and test. Let's do that. Run and test. Um, and it says that my SDK is old and it says can't create a file. Yeah. I don't know what that's doing, but uh, it is in another window over here, spinning stuff up here um, and listening and doing things. And did it work? I don't know. I mean, it ran, um, but it also shows red stuff. So I'm not sure. Um, let's let's try and open Visual Studio. So identity server and API here. And if somebody else has a question while I get this started, go feel free. Yeah, no, so far nothing. Um, All right, so these tests, I think, are just standard X unit tests, right? Um, but I think I have to host the thing for it to work. So if I remember right, because this is not using the, uh, the functional test um, that use that test host. So I think I have to spin up this thing to run it. So let's run app. There, this is running. And, and we can see, like, if I try and call the service and I'm not logged in, it should give me a 401 or something. Um, it says not logged in. I can log in. Is it even doing anything? I don't know. It seems to not be doing a whole lot. Um, there. Type error. Cannot read access token of null. Okay. That's fine. How about login? Open ID cores. Oh, cores is oh cores is always a problem. Um, all right. Well let's let's not worry about that. Let's pretend that that's not a problem. Let's go try and run our test. So come down here and there's our facts. Let's just run all the tests. I think I think the answer is going to be that two year old code out on the internet doesn't actually still work. But, uh, but that's okay. I, I really appreciate you trying. This is actually a lot of fun. Oh, they, they 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 came with green. That's cool. Yeah. Um, so so yeah. So maybe they do work. Um, I don't know why the JavaScript client's not working. Something something I have to set up with cores. Um, which usually I just say let everything in when I'm doing a demo. Yeah. Um, but here it's it's able to hit a public endpoint without a token. It's able to hit an API endpoint with a token. Um, and verify that it got what it's supposed to get. Uh, let's let's. I don't have a test for it, but let's verify that it works without setting the token. And by works, I, I think I mean it should blow up, right? So let's run the test. Now we saw it was green, and if we don't have a token, it should fail, and it did. Yes. And it fails, and it says something like, uh, "Well, that's great. True, false. Thanks. Good job, Steve." Um, yeah, so it, it's uh, this is success status code. And so why is it not a success status code? Well, we could debug it. And it would tell us that the response was a 401, probably. We'll find out. Wait for it. This is why I don't debug. It's so damn slow. There we go. Uh, API response is a 401, unauthorized, blah, 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 blah. OK, so um, yeah, there you go. Tony, I think, was the one that asked that. So that's. Mm -hmm. That's how you could write tests. That's one way you could write tests. Yeah, I told you the cheater way is to just go in and say, allow anonymous, and then you can test all the functionality except for authentication. Um, but you can also generate access tokens for your tests um, inside your test code and then pass them around. All right, well, I think that may be it. But uh, again, I'd like to thank you so much for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. This has probably been the most active we've had um, as far as crowd participation. So I feel like we set the bar really high here. I don't know where we're going to go after this, but we'll figure <laughs> it out. Um, uh, there's a bunch of new people in here. So, you know, we're here second Wednesday of every month. You can find us, you know, on Twitch, YouTube, any of the social media stuff. This Sunday, I will be doing, you know, live coding. We do, um, just Sunday streams where we hang out and just put whatever together, showcase local users and their projects. I think this Sunday will be me doing some blazer with Azure functions. So 
Be sure to check that out. Thank you again, Steve. Really appreciate you coming and sharing this with us. It's been fantastic. My phone's been blowing up with people who've enjoyed this. So it's a lot of good feedback. Um, okay. Thank you, Jeremy, for coming in and filling in for the other Jeremy. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll see y'all next month. All right, let me let me just plug my Twitch yeah, stream too. Uh, I'm on Twitch as our Dallas. I'm usually streaming open source stuff on Fridays, like afternoon, usually like three to five p.m. But it varies. Awesome. Yeah, be sure to check. I think we're gonna. I don't know if we have you all to host it, but we will soon. I will get on that, and yeah, we'll we'll share all your stuff, and we appreciate it. Cool. Thanks a lot. It was fun.